Right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to another session of Carbon Curious. Thanks for joining us today. Um, today, we're going to be looking at poplars and pastures on farm planting for shade and carbon credits. And with me, I have Steve Tresider, who uh, is a farmer in the Hawke's Bay area at Nisbet Estate and recently won the 2022 Farm Forester of the Year Award from PAMPAC. So welcome, Steve. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Um, we've got a fair bit to run through today, so I'm going to dive right into it. Um, oh, sorry, we also have with us, um, along with Steve, uh, Warwick Hesketh, who's the Hawke's Bay Regional Council Catchment Management Advisor, um, and he's been doing a lot of work with Steve, supporting the, the plantings they've been doing with poplars across the farm. So if you if you see someone suddenly fade in from the forest, to Steve's right, then, then that's Warwick. Um, as usual, Welcome any questions through the session. We'll get to them at the end as best we can. Uh, drop them into the Q and A panel in the uh, the Zoom thing below. I I don't actually know how to do it myself, but I assume I assume there's a little Q and A box there which you click and it lets you ask questions. So diving right into it, uh, Steve. This is this is I guess it's not home, is it for you? You manage the place, but you're not. Do you live there as well at the moment? Yes, no, no, we live there. Um... Well, I've been there for well over 30 years now, um, but we have got our own block down the road. So this yep. place is 247 hectares, probably about 230 or probably less than that effective these days. Yep. Um, yeah, it's, um, it, it's it's a place I manage for Nisbets and yep. um, kind of treated as if it was my own block. So they've allowed me to go and do things I think I should, you know, should be done on a... Um, sustainable fashion on the farm and I enjoy trees and that side of it too so yeah yeah and you've been there for 30 years now you said over 30 probably 35 years ever since now but the time goes pretty quick <laughs> yeah and how has it developed over that period I mean what what have you what's changed what stayed the same um well I've, I've intensified I, I came from a family farm which was reasonably intensive so when I got there it was a reasonably extensive sort of a farm not a, no electric fencing or anything and, and not many trees um, so it was just, it's just morphed into what it is slowly, um, just through, and then the pole planting has been one of the things that we've done because of the farm is quite erodible, like a lot of New Zealand, and especially the east coast of the North Island, it's clay soil, and it needs stabilising, um, and that's where we've done poplars and willows over the years to try and stabilise it, um, and switching more to poplars these days, because the willows tend to be Bit messy, they break and stuff like that. But the poplars are, um, are are really good, yeah, and they've done a job. And of course, now they're being financially um, very rewarding. Yep. So of, of what we're looking at here, there's like all of these little green blobs, which we'll take a closer look later. Are obviously trees. What's the fraction of poplars versus willows, and compared to the exotic box that which I think you had a couple of of which have perhaps been recently harvested? Yeah. So. There's 30, I think there's 31 hectares registered under the ETS of poplars and willows. Um, yeah. And of the poplars and willows, I was doing 50-50 planting of poplars and willows, but I've gone more to 10% a, a willows and 90% and uh, poplars these days. Um, gotcha. There's more of the farm that can be planted and and linked into the, the, the areas that are uh, registered to make it a bigger area and also there's some fresh plantings that aren't quite visible yet so um yeah. give those a few years and that and they will come under it too so um yeah it's been good stuff uh, hmm. so I, I put this one up just to embarrass you i understand that you didn't actually make it to the awards you had your team team turn up to take the credit for you <coughs> but can you give yeah. us a bit of background as to what this award recognized and what specifically about the stuff you're doing on the farm it was that they were sort of applauding yeah the reason i wasn't at the awards is i was like many people in new zealand at that time had COVID, which was a good time so, um oh man that's a bit so, of a rip off so anyway it's affected a lot of people oh, but, you, you can um, have your moment in the limelight now then so, yeah there you go <laughs> so you know so the owners um which are the two girls in the middle there um that photo they um they accepted the water on my behalf. But it, it it's it meant a hell of a lot. You know, I'm I'm what am I, 63 now? So I mean reaching the end of my farming career and to achieve this was it meant it was huge. That's um, really cool. So, you know, and, and it's not something I um I was kind of pushed in it away. I didn't like everyone who does these sort of things, you never think you're gonna be good enough and the trees 
a lot of the trees, are, a lot of natives have got are quite small and and um, and not very noticeable yet. But um, it, it, yeah, I, 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 was, I was yeah really chuffed, really happy, and and not and not so much, um, and more for the owners too. You know, it's their farm, yep. so um, it's just an appreciation. They've been very good to work for, and and it's just appreciation appreciation for their support with me doing what I wanted to do. Yeah, you know, I'm pretty passionate about the job, so um, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. It, it was really great and interesting to me to see it because I mean I think you mentioned it's primarily a land sort of stabilization and uh, environmental resilience action for you as opposed to sort of a, a forestry activity though you did mention I think looking at the poplars in particular as a possible timber product in the future. Totally. Um, field day we had there the other day um, talked about that a bit I mean it was pointed out a poplar in the distance was worth $800 unpruned um, you know, and it could be worth well over a thousand dollars. So these these trees, yep. and, and that's one of the reasons I guess I want to put it out there. They're highly underrated the poplars um, yep. in a New Zealand situation. And I think I said to you the other day, my preference on on this sort of country, which is which is a, a huge area in New Zealand, is, is typical with this, um, would be poplars first, um, pine trees second, and natives third. And, and the, the poplars are so beneficial. I mean, you've got so you've got the timber, you've got the timber side of things, you've got the land stabilization, they can be chopped down or the branches taken off for fodder in the drought, which I've done before. Yeah, so, okay, you have actually done that. That's really interesting. I what's yeah. the sort of how much feed do you get from one? Do you have a, a rough metric there? Like because oh. I'd heard that and I've never heard of anybody who actually did it. Yeah, I don't I don't know if there's any I haven't actually got down and measured it, but it is quite yeah. I don't know why you know should have that side of it. Um, there's, there's, there's very high nutritional value. Um, yep. Yes, yeah, so and that's it, that's not at the expense of the tree, right? So sorry, what? No, no, no. Warwick might want to say something about that. I'm just yep. going to comment that there have been papers and things produced about um, about well, the condensed tannins and all that sorts of good nutritional value. But I think yep. for a lot of people, it's it's just something that they can do. Um, you know. If, if there is a drought, it's, it's sort of like standing hay in a way. They can um, yeah. um, chop it down and, and get them through a tough patch. Um, I would say that, you know, if, well, once once you do it, um, once you pull out a tree, you do kind of have to keep doing it because you're not going to get that nice straight um, trunk that you might get otherwise if you'd, if you'd um, form pruned it for timber. Okay. So that was actually going to be one of my questions. When you say chop it down, you're talking about, knock the whole thing over like a short distance off the ground by pollarding as opposed to just stripping off a bunch of the lower branches well what i did is i just chopped the branches down uh, the lower branches um okay yeah that's what i did but it it, it, it it's a it's quite a job and it, and it does make a hell of a mess to tidy up afterwards so yeah yeah uh, they don't they don't eat the wood i guess no 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 but they do get pretty addicted to it once they hear the chainsaw start up they're all rushing over so, <laughs> so that that's you know that's one of the many benefits of of, of poplars um yep. you know what we've got areas a farm opposite me that's gone into pines it's owned by a guy in hong kong and this farm wasn't bad there's another farm that's been sold to trees just down the road yep. it's a, a way better option would be to plant poplars and, and willows and New Zealand can you can get the credits from those to meet our you know our carbon emissions um, what we're trying to strive for um, yep. without doing pine trees and all the downstream um, bad effects that's had you know especially yep. the Gisborne and all that side of it. So yeah, I mean I guess there's the the regime that you've got here is quite different as well. It's not kind of um, clear fell forestry at the end of it. You're sort of doing closer to a continuous canopy model for the areas that you have right. planted, even if you were to harvest it, right? That's correct. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, Super no. interesting. Mm. Um. So I, I think I, I should have got to the slide earlier. I think I've asked you most of this question. Um. You've you've talked through the benefits pretty clearly, but um. Are these both pictures of the farm as it is now? It's sort of on the left versus the right, and on the right hand side, are you anticipating further plantings there? So on on the left. That's just a, a general view of the farm, and on the right is some flatter areas where we've got native shelter belts. Um, yep. where we do a lot of the um, triplet lambing out in those paddocks. So, yep. 
Yeah, it's just it, it's shoulder belts. For it. So some of the flat areas I won't be planting in. Um, I just can't quite see the screen that well, but in the background of the one on the right, the we areas we'll be planting up. Um, yep. They be some poles there now, but so we I try and target an area and, and, and plant that, and, and it's not yep. always successful. The first year you might get some years in the drought, you might only get forty percent survivability, but you keep going yep. and, and and try and fill in the gaps as much as you can. It's just it's a it's a long game, you know. It's, it doesn't yep. Um, yep. happen overnight, but um, yeah. Great stuff. Yeah, I guess that's an interesting consideration as well when we get to ETS eligibility is sort of sufficient stocking and consideration of survival rates and like for when you're you're chasing your, your canopy cover target. So jumping into that now, I mean, this will be very old news for you given your experience, but for everybody on the call, like you, you agroforestry is a thing. Obviously, it can work very well um, if you know what you're doing, as Steve clearly does. Um, but there's certain requirements that you have to meet if you're going to register your sort of trees that are planted with mixed use agriculture in the ETS. And I've got a summary of these here. So it's got to be minimum of one hectare in area that you've got for sort of the, the bounded forest area. And that area has to be at least 30 meters wide on average. It's, you've got to be able to demonstrate that it achieved forest status after 1989. And the key for space planting really is that you've got to have canopy coverage above 30%. And there's a, um, and then, then it has to be a tree species. So it has to be able to achieve greater than five meters of height, which isn't, isn't a big problem for poplars, obviously. Um, on the right there, we've got what 30% canopy cover looks like. So those those white circles are occupying 30% of the total area in that square. That's the minimum. You don't want to be cutting it too fine. Um, if, if you do lose a tree, then you can potentially end up with compliance issues. But could you sort of comment briefly, Steve, on how you've approached this and the, the spacings that you've gone for and sort of the balance of um, pasture productivity versus um, EDS eligibility and the sort of the other goals you're looking to achieve around hill stability and the like. Yeah, right. So we've done 15 meter spacings, but um, yep. it can go further out. So you, you you want to plant more than actually what you do need because you know, as you say, survivability can be an issue. Um, yep. A lot of people will say, well, that affect pasture growth. It, it does to certainly, but the beauty about the poplars and willows is they lose their leaves over the winter, so it opens the ground up, and in the summer, especially the hot summers Hawke's Bay normally gets, which we're not having this year. Um, it, 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 it creates, um, it's, it stays moist under the trees and stays green. So it, um, some yeah. people say it actually grows more grass. So it, it it's it's hugely, um, it doesn't affect the stocking rate. Um, well, I okay, which is a key, the key indicator, I guess, really. Yeah, if, if you can get the same amount of stock on it, then clearly the productivity is staying up. That's right. That's right. Yep. So it's um, it's a double whammy. You know, you've got you got your you got your stock plus you got your carbon money coming from the trees, yep. which is pretty much doubling your income per hectare. You know, um, yep. on, on a very generic general basis. Yeah, so, we'll get into some of the details of that shortly. I guess there's some caveats, like it's it's for a certain period, and then there's ongoing obligations around durability and whatnot. But it's still, yeah. Yeah, significant. Um, I I have heard recently that there were some sort of additional benefits through reduced heat stress for stock due to shade that could actually reduce their increase their productivity and reduce their feed demands just because you had shade rather than being in the sweltering sun. Have you noticed that at all? Have uh, you any thoughts on it? Yeah, well, it's probably a fact. I know um, a lot of dairy farms have done some research on that, and and I guess. Yeah. Cross over to sheep too, the same sort of situation. Yeah, they certainly heat stress is a major thing. Um, yep. You certainly get them, they're certainly sitting under the trees on, on a hot summer's day. I mean, uh, yep. yeah, heat stress it would be an issue. And, and as far as measuring it, I, I haven't. And they probably, I know, as, as I say, the dairy farmers have done stuff. Do yep. notice a big benefit in that. Um, yeah, so it, there's, there's, there's huge benefits all around. And, yeah. If nothing else, aesthetically, it's pleasing to the eye too. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. It's beautiful. I mean, lots of different forms of farm are beautiful. I love open open country as well, but certainly like these pictures we have here, it looks stunning. Yep. Um, so getting into some of the performance details, this is this is a bit of a breakdown of what you'd get under the current rules in terms of tons of CO2 per hectare per year, depending on the age of the species and how the the total tons of carbon stock increase over time. And so this is down along the bottom here is years of age. 
Um, the blue line is the increase in carbon stock, but the it's actually the green columns that are the most important from an economic perspective for a landholder um, in the short term. The, the blue one's going to be your liability at some point, because this says how many NZUs you earn each year based on the growth, and that's potentially how much money you can get for it. And a key point here is that this is based on the hardwood tables for species within the emissions trading scheme. And it assumes that your forest area that's registered is less than 100 hectares, because that means that you get to use the standard tables. The moment you go above 100 hectares, you're actually measuring the farm specific growth. And that means that with a, a low density space planted regime, your carbon yield is going to drop enormously, because these assumptions are based on sort of timber plantation eucalyptus regions. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later on, because an important thing for anybody considering agroforestry with poplars or willows in New Zealand is the ongoing consultation in New Zealand with the ETS around specific lookup tables for space planted poplars and willows, which are going to give quite different yields. Um, so I'll keep on moving on, but um, this is sort of what you're talking about with the, the returns. Um, assuming that you're below 100 hectares and under the current regime where it's just the standard exotic hardwood table, and at a carbon price of $75 per NZU, which is roughly the current spot price, um, by sort of age six through to age 16, you're getting well over $2,000 per hectare per year. Um, this ignores the cost of establishment and it ignores any costs of sort of ongoing care and maintenance and stuff. But um, do you have any comments on sort of what you've experienced in practice versus what the theory here says? Oh, no, I think you, 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 you did right. I mean, an average sheep and beef farm um, around here would, would need to return around $500 a hectare. That's probably been reasonably optimistic. Um, yep. So anything above that is, is, is hugely beneficial. Um, and we're getting way above that with these. With these. Yep. I know it's not for the, the long term, but um, yeah. And, and, it's, and, and there's so many people do not realise it. Even farmers around here still do not yeah. realise that you can actually, it's a no-brainer, absolute no-brainer. And a lot of people have planted these trees, as I have, for erosion control, not even realising that you can actually cash in and make quite substantial money. Um, and, I, and I would and I would put it out there that a lot of these farms that have been sold, if they realised the income stream they had, probably wouldn't be selling them. But they, they, yeah, change the equation of it. Yeah, I, I think a big part of it, you're right, is just like we've we've registered something like 300 pe uh, different um, entities in the ETS now. And like it was very, very common that the, the almost the hardest step of the process was convincing them that it was real and that we weren't just there peddling snake oil. Because you sort of turn up and say, hey, but do you realize you could realize these returns from your hillside there if you did erosion control planting? I mean, the, the picture there is going to change for erosion control planting with the space planting proposals, but it's still pretty good as we'll get to, like the from a net present value perspective, which I think is also very important for people to consider. Like, obviously, it tails off. Eventually, you stop learning from carbon, but as long as it's you want it there for all the other co-benefits it brings, even if you just put this money in the bank as you received it and then started collecting interest on it, it's going to, like it, the long-term annuity you'd get just through the return on the capital that you accrued or the reduction in your debt um, and the avoided interest is enormous. And that's that's enduring. That's forever, even once the trees stop growing. Yeah, right. And, and, and that's not even talking about the timber value of these trees. Yeah, yeah, um, true. Very good point. I mean, a, 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 a fun fact, whether it's true or not, but I did hear a while ago that when they looked at planting New Zealand, uh, getting pine trees planted in Kauai Aurora and some of the big forests, Poplar was one of the species they were looking at. And it's a hugely, um, it's used widely overseas in a lot of different things. So yeah, yep. highly, very underrated. Um, so the, the, these trees we, we plant, we do have to, um, like if they die out, we have to keep, we replant them, but I have yep. planted quite intensively. So we, um, you know, so if any die that we, we will replace those. I think these the trees on this bits were planted under the old sawtooth um, scenario, yeah. which you might explain more, a bit more about. Me. But um, yeah, the guy yeah. in that new regime. Yep, which is very important for people to understand the distinction. So I've I've put in the comparison here of the annual carbon yields for exotic hardwoods, which is currently what you get poplars in under versus radiata, and it's interesting that over the first like fifteen to sixteen years, the current 
um, sequestration profile for um, hardwoods delivers a lot more sequestration on paper, and which means in your bank account, than with radiata, in large part due to the sort of this weird teenage period that radiatas go through where they sort of, they wind right back for a little bit before they really kick into life again. And this is particularly important in the context of the, the new accounting rules, because under averaging, and I, I didn't actually get a chance to check the exact number prior to the session, but I'm pretty sure that the average year for both average age for both species is around 16 years. So that's the point that under averaging, you stop earning additional carbon from that point on, but you don't face any liabilities on harvest. Um, different story were you to register them under the permit forestry category, but there's some other constraints to be aware of there. Um, so I'm just eyeballing it, I'm pretty sure that um, you would get more over the sort of the useful yield period from um, hardwoods than from radiata. Because the fact that radiata goes gangbusters into the later years isn't actually relevant under an averaging accounting method. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so to, to kind of have a look at that in practice, and I'll switch across, can you guys still see this now? Has it, has it turned into a map? Are we uh, looking at a map or it's kind of moving around or are we still stuck on the presentation? Now we're looking at a map, yep. Sweet, okay. So um, this is a, a quick look at the, um, the carbon crop um, management platform, which we're just using for an example. So a quick caveat up front, this isn't data that Steve's provided, like this doesn't necessarily represent the registration that's on the farm and all of the financials that you're about to see here are just numbers that we are forecasting. It's not farm specific details, um, which we don't want to share, but this is this is just the raw output of our um, AI running its eye over the farm basically and trying to spot where the trees are. I think you mentioned you had on the order of um, 31 hectares registered. Yes, that's correct, yeah. We've, we've picked out 38. I think maybe we're slightly optimistic in some cases, possibly the, some of this is the more recent stuff that you haven't quite quite got around to registering yet. Mm. Um, but I thought it was very interesting to look at like areas over here, um, sort of the what qualifies as space planting and what qualifies as coverage and sort of this these various thresholds and sort of what the thinking that you go through when you're looking at areas like this in terms of what you're gonna register and where you're going to plant further trees. Can you sort of talk through some of the thinking of when you're planting this area? Well, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm not actually planting uh, root well. I wasn't, haven't been planting uh, as far as registering trees with the ETS because it wasn't in my yeah. concept. But um, oh yeah, it so came what, along what, later. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what what we have talked about at, at different field days is linking. So you're linking two areas. One area might be like half a hectare or whatever, trying to make that one hectare. So you you put trees in to link those areas to match them up. But but invariably that linking may be a ridge or something where it's hard to establish. Um, but you know, and you don't you get less survivability. But that's that is a thing when you these days I'm thinking about how to link smaller areas into one area to make it big enough yep. to be interested. Um, which certainly you can see there's potential for down here, which right. um, yeah. our algorithms must like by the ETS rules, you can basically bridge a 30 meter gap. Um, that's often called the 15 meter rule, but the, the technical constraint is that no point on a line can be more than 15 meters from a point at which it intersects the canopy, which 30 meters obviously lets you jump, which is a fair way. Um, hmm. Often you kind of run into issues with the falling below the canopy density threshold um, before you start being able to join up too many things. But what's interesting is that this, this mapping that we've done here is completely compliant with the ETS rules. Like you're allowed significant areas within an area as long as the overall area within a given hectare is still above 30% threshold, which I mean, eyeballing it here, looks like it probably is if I pull out some vegetation data, like you can sort of see the rough vegetation boundaries and this is reasonably conservative, we've left some stuff out, but the fact that it's drawn a full boundary around this suggests that the canopy cover within this area is still greater than 30% with the way you planted it, because there's obviously some 100% segments on the edge. Yeah. Um, and so looking at this block here, um, for those numbers we were talking about before, so this is 10 hectares. Um, the estimate I had was that it'd been gone on sort of somewhere around 2005 to 2010. Does that sound about right? Oh, yeah, probably longer time period um, because, you, yeah, it's, it's, like I started planting in 89 and I'm still yeah. kind of now, so some of them be older, some of them be, yeah, we're just average, averaging out everything. Um, a lot of those trees yeah. that you see look pretty dense, but what I am doing is because we have planted them reasonably dense, I'm going through and selectively poisoning some of the um, yeah. willows especially to try and open okay. up. But the initial the initial planting was for land stabilization, and once it's achieved that, 
then I can start thinning them out as long as I um, are still meeting the requirements of the of the ETS. Yep. So that's once they sort of the individual trees grow a bit more mature. So one one tree can stabilize more land. Is that what you mean? That's, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Very interesting. Um, jumping back to the presentation. So I wanted to get on to the the implications of this upcoming consultation. So sort of what it is, why it's happening, and what it could mean for the returns, and sort of what it what it means from your perspective. Are you going to stop stop doing this, or are you going to keep going? So. As to what it is, it's currently a, a consultation. Um, the consultation is now closed um, with MPI. I'm, I'm not sure whether there'll be a subsequent one with more details. But the reason that they had the consultation is basically in the pursuit of accuracy. Like it's it's generally accepted and I think reasonably intuitively obvious that space planted poplars are not going to sequester as much carbon per hectare as a high density timber plantation of eucalypts. Um, it's not to say that it's a bad idea or that they shouldn't receive carbon, but you're probably going to get more sequestration going on in a high density forestry plantation than in an agroforestry regime. And the ETS is generally quite conserved with the accuracy of carbon sequestration. So that's that's their motivation is they're trying to make the, the awarded credits more consistent with the actual carbon being sequestered. And the implications are that at least by their proposal, there's going to be a lot less carbon issued to um, space planted poplars and willows specifically, which is key to note is that at the moment it's a species specific proposal. And the threshold that's um, proposed in the consultation is a couple of different um, um, stems per hectares that they've considered for the sequestration profile, but one of the key thresholds is 220 stems per hectare, which works out to about seven meter spacing. And I think you said you were doing about 15 or so. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's like, you'd have to actually be planting at quite high densities to go above the threshold that they're proposing, which means that a lot of um, sort of erosion control plantings on farms will fall below it unless you're actually deciding to retire a hillside because it's so slip prone and you're basically converting the whole thing to forest. And what you can see here over on the, the right, which is just a, a um, sequestration profile taken straight from the consultation is over here on the left, we've got tons of hectares, uh, tons of carbon per hectare down here, the age. And this dotted line up the top here is um, the current exotic hardwood table. And then the blue lines are Kawa, Poplar species, um, at two different um, planting densities, or three rather, so 200 stems per hectare, 100 stems per hectare, and 50 stems per hectare. And then the goldy sort of colour is Veronese poplars, which are pretty similar to crow's nest poplars. Um, which species have you been going for predominantly? Steve. Oh, mixture of most mostly kawa, some Veronese, yeah. So just very interesting that it's mostly kawa, because so basically the the proposal is that um the or at least the consultation proposal was for the hundred stem per hectare Veronese profile, which is obviously a hell of a lot lower than the hundred stem per hectare kawa profile, mm -hmm. um because they're much narrower canopy and tend to be taller, but. What this means for the commercial yields, and here I've got three different profiles, um, and this is sort of the dollars per hectare on the same terms as we were looking at before, 75 bucks a tonne. Uh, the yellow bars are what you would have been getting today under the exotic hardwood table. Red is what you get from Veronese at 200 stems per hectare, and blue, which I think was the proposal for the single table approach, is what you get from, from 100 stems per hectare. So it's it's a lot lower. There's no two two ways of seeing that. And even the fact that in the midterm they're showing the Veronese yield actually exceeds the um, the exotic hardwoods. They're also proposing a 21 year um, attributed harvest interval for the purposes of averaging, which means that everything beyond 21 years you don't get anyway. So it's definitely on the the shift is going to result in a significant loss of yield. Um, I also ran some quick numbers just to kind of calibrate that on what the net present value implication would be. So we were talking before about if you sort of took that future cash flow stream and tried to value as it was today and maybe put it in the bank or used it to pay down your, your debt or whatever it was. Um, under a 35 year term, assuming that you didn't harvest at the end of it, so you don't have the liability on harvest, um, hardwoods are $14,000 per hectare net present value at $75 per tonne and 10% discount. 200 stem per hectare Veronese is six and a half thousand, 
hundred stem per hectare, Veronese is 2,700. And this drops further when you consider that probably you're going to be registered under the averaging regime, which means that you're only going to get the carbon out to 21 years. So I don't know if you've looked at these numbers before, Steve, or what your thoughts are on them or how they sort of steer your thinking on on whether whether this is reasonable or whether you'd want to whether you'd still be looking at doing what you're doing. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I didn't realise. What do you reckon? Down to a seven meter um, spacing. That's um, yeah, that's that's pretty close. Um, I, yeah, I haven't seen those figures before, but um, yeah, yeah I, I guess I'll still carry on planting for land erosion. Um, yep. And maybe yeah, I'd have to look at the closer plantings, but um, it's still you're still doing it for land erosion number one um, and shelter and stuff like that. So it, you're still getting a benefit, not only running your stock, but also um, the carbon money on top of that, which was which was one of the main things that I you know I keep pushing. But I haven't, yeah, no, I'm not overly familiar with the latest emissions and. Uh, yeah, no, it's surprising me that it's seven meters. That's yeah, it's pretty close. It's just pretty dense. Yeah, um, mm. I, it's worth noting as well that this is just a consultation at the moment. It's not like this is a done deal. Current regulations are as they are, but certainly MPI have generally been indicating reasonably enough an interest in accuracy where they can, because like our our international accounts also have to be accurate as best we can, and that's what we're sort of ultimately this twenty four billion dollar figure that gets mentioned of our international liabilities. The that depends on the true carbon sequestration. The it was kind of encouraging to me though that even even let's take the worst case scenario here, two thousand per hectare NPV. That's still a significant boost if you're also getting a whole bunch of co benefits, and certainly it's more than enough to pay for the cost of establishment. I think I don't know if you can. Oh, I I think I've got a section a little bit later, but oh, let's cover it now. What does it cost? What does it cost to kind of get into this? If you're trying to make the economic case for it, ignoring all of the benefits around stability and fodder and shade and stuff, just the cost to establish the poplars versus these carbon yields, how does it look? Well, I might, I might hand over to Warwick because that's kind of his expertise on that on that side of it. And uh, can you read? Cool, I'll chip in here. So um, yeah, normally we're selling poplar as a pole, as a three metre pole, uh, which is worth around um, 13 bucks, I think. Um, there's a, a sleeve that often goes with that, so that's another seven or eight bucks. We estimate that a poplar in the ground, um, by the time it's been planted and transported to site, is probably worth around 30 bucks. Um, for erosion control, we're sort of looking at around 40 or 50 stems a hectare. Uh, what I would say here in Hawke's Bay and in, in the, some other regional councils as well is that we have erosion control grounds. Um gotcha. actually meeting half of that half of that total cost to get the um, to get the poles established. Okay, and even thirty bucks um a stem at fifty stems per hectare is fifteen hundred, which is less than the lowest of the net present values here. So in, in theory you could take out a loan from the bank at a ten percent interest rate and you still get your money back, assuming that the carbon price stayed at seventy five dollars a ton, which I guess fingers crossed. Um, but yeah, what you're saying with the grants that exist, that's a hell of a lot easier than that because you're, the, the council will support you with half the cost. Yeah, that's, that's correct. And sometimes we do have to have some difficult conversations because um, if people are wanting to get that hectare of eligible land and that involves planting some areas that aren't um, prone to erosion control, we, we might not subsidise those particular piles. So, yeah. Um, yeah, but for us, first and foremost, it's about holding the hills together. Yep, yeah, which has a whole heap of downstream, no pun intended, benefits. Um, <laughs> which I, I think I might have skipped past that, but oh no, I didn't. Here, here we go. This was the one I was mentioning. So we talked about the direct returns. They're definitely going to change. I mean, there's the story's not finished there. It would definitely be worth anybody looking into the space, making sure they're very conscious about what the future changes in the... Um, the recognition frameworks will be because they will have an implication for the financial returns. But looking away from the direct economic returns, can you talk a little bit about the, I mean, I think these photos were possibly from post-Cyclone Gabriel, is that right? Yes, yeah. So the ones on the right are, um, are actually two different properties. The, one, the properties on the left is our property, which we've got down the road, which hasn't got as many trees, purely because it's all, it's a cattle raising. 
And so even when you plant these three metre poles with the sleeves, you, you've got to keep the cattle out for at least five years because they, they'll just knock them over. So I'm actually yep. going through the process at the moment is of um, getting a bank loan or, or whatever to 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 plant that place up. Um, so it's far easier if you've got a normal sheep regime or a mixture of sheep and beef where you can put the sheep into an area where you freshly planted and, and, and raise that for the next five years before you bring the cattle in. Um, sure. but, but that cyclone certainly, um, the differences between the areas that were planted and the unplanted areas where you can see it here, it's, it, it's just chalk and cheese. Um, it, 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 a massive difference. I mean, if, that, if yep. the East Coast and Gabriel was planted up extensively in poplars and willows, you would not have had the downstream effects of, of the silt or well, there would have been a lot less. Yep. And, and because you're space plant, you know, you're not densely planting like a like a pine forest, you haven't got the, the flash that could potentially come down downstream, as you know, um, with, with clear filling of frost and all that issues. Yep. I've done involved in that. So environmentally, the Hugely beneficial, hugely. No, I just ever keep harking back to. I don't. I think they're totally underrated. Um, yep. It's not enough talk about it. Um, so hopefully you guys can spread the good word. And, um, oh, we've got all the people on the call who are hopefully going to go and tell all their friends and go and buy some poplars. Yeah, yeah. I just think it's it's just you know for New Zealand. Um, I think it's just it's it's a it's a big thing. But, but as you say, these rules are changing, so that might just change yep. the scenario. But, but if nothing else. Yeah. Um, Stabilizing land has got to be a good thing. Especially yeah, my impression is that it'll it'll change it, but it probably won't change the like if if you thought it was worth doing before, it'll probably still be worth doing. If you hated the idea of having poplars before, then you probably wouldn't have been planting them anyway. Um, no. But if you like the idea of having poplars and stabilizing your hills, I don't think the changes are going to make it a, a non viable activity. Um, any kind of stuff just before we wrap up that you you'd tell somebody looking to get into it, like. What should you be conscious of? You mentioned the, the cost, you mentioned the need to kind of consider stock exclusion in the case of cattle. What else is there to weigh up? Oh, it, it's it's a long game. Don't 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 think you're gonna do it all in one year or two years. You just chip away um, a little bit of the time. It's like how do you need an elephant? Just a little bit of the time. And and, and yep. you never don't you do your head in if you try and think, God brought this farm, you know, how am I gonna get it? Up and running straight away. You just got to do a little bit every year, and, and as I say, I've been at the over thirty years, and so you just chip away, and eventually forms into what it is. But um, yeah, yeah, I, I, it, it's um, and physically, you know, you ram these poles in, you, 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 you're ramming them into softer ground, which is where they need to be for to stabilise the ground. So it's a bit, it's um, reasonably physical sort of a job, but it's not, it's not yeah. too bad. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any other. I don't know what. Can you think of any? Um, I don't know, that seems. No, there's a few, few things you've got here. So yeah, there there are um, there are things that you need to consider. Um I'd also what varieties, um, and that might be dictated by the type of erosion that you have as well. So a good idea would be to get get one of us, get one of the um, regional council land management or catchment advisors out, um, and they could help talk you through the ropes. And, and hook you up with the grant process as well. Okay. Keeping all that salt out of the rivers. Good stuff. Cool. Um, what's your vision for the future, Steve? I mean, you said you were you were sort of imagining you got a few years left on the place still. Um, where would you like to see it 10 and sort of 30 years from now? Oh, I don't know. As I say, I won't be there in 30 years' time, but um, I would like to see it carry on. Um, you know, I'd like to be involved in the farm and, as a, you know, almost like an advisory type role to help people yep. I mean, and in, in future in general. I mean, I like to think I can walk the talk. Um, so, um, proven it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I just think just slowly keep on doing what we're doing, really, uh, is the yep. main thing. Um, you know, and to get recognition from different ones. Um, I, I know Warwick has evolved in the judging, so have recognition from these guys was was pretty amazing, really. So, you know, we, we're doing the right thing, I think. <laughs> yeah, I really liked as well. I didn't include the, the images, but just the um, the accolades that you got from a bunch of the other partners you're working with. I mean, we should give credit to Forest360, who did the work on this block for you with the registration. I saw Ansco, who I think you're a supplier to, was kind of singing your praises when you won the award of, like, 
I think it's great that there's sort of this broad, um, broadly embraced um, agroforestry support because I think there is a lot of potential in it. And when you talk to farmers in the context of Hawaka Kanoa and future greenhouse gas taxes and stuff, there there can be a bit of an idea of you're forcing me to go into forestry and like retire my land. But there is the sort of the middle path that I think can be very beneficial and can actually improve the overall farm output in multiple dimensions. So yeah. it's great to see a, a worked example of it in practice. Yeah, you know, I've always been of the opinion that you farm for the next generation, for the future. You don't farm, you're leaving it for someone else. And and that's the sad part about it. Some of these places up the East Coast in Gisborne have, have been settled in the 1800s and the and, and, and those guys set those farms up for future generations. And to see them planted in pines is, is really, you know, sad. You know, that those those guys probably didn't make a lot when they were farming, but they did it for future generations. And I'd, I'd like to think what I've done there is, is, is on this bit, is trying to set it up for the future. Um, yep. do, do my bit while I'm around. And I guess, it, it you know, it's a little part of New Zealand, but at least I'm doing something. And yeah, I just think, that's my philosophy anyway. I'd like to leave the place in a in a better situation than when I started. And I think yep. um, if everyone has that sort of attitude, and um, you know, I think it would it'd be beneficial. Really. But that's 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 the way I look at it anyway. Yeah, I think you've done a stellar job of it, and certainly thinking ahead of the the challenges over the coming decade or two, like increasing heat waves and stuff, having alternative fodder and shade is going to be important and increasing rainfall, having your slopes stabilised is going to be pretty valuable. So if there's anybody on the call who's interested in doing this, uh, certainly get in touch with us and we can sort of um, link you through to people who can help and provide you some sort of estimates of costs and the potential returns you could get and what the plantings might look like. All right, um, it's 20 past one. Um, apologies to everybody on the calls that we ran a bit long. Uh, Steve, I really appreciate your time. It's really impressive what you've achieved there. And I think it's a great example of sort of how you can you can combine multiple activities to improve the outcome across several different dimensions, including environmental resilience and sort of broader climate change implications, plus farm profitability. And yeah, congrats on the award. I think it's well deserved. And thanks as well, Warwick, for joining and, and your insights. Uh, thanks, Nick. I really appreciate having the opportunity to um, have a say on this matter. I'm pretty, pretty passionate. Um, Warwick's pretty passionate about the whole thing too. So it's good to have the yep. opportunity to um, express how we feel about it. And, and yeah, really, thank, thank you. Not all. Fantastic stuff. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your days, everybody.